Hello, welcome to the Monday, August 14th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Business email compromise is still a big issue, and Mark wrote up a brief diary about one particular common scenario that leads to this kind of attack. What happens here is that a company uses Outlook Web Access and a user loses their credentials to phishing. Whenever you have a web-based interface to access your email, then of course anybody from anywhere in the world typically can access that interface and then log in as that user and read emails, respond to them or delete them so the legitimate user will never see them. What happens typically here is that the attacker then either becomes more familiar with business processes or directly sees, for example, an email from a customer asking for wire transfer instructions, which then, of course, are answered by the attacker on behalf of the legitimate owner of that email account, which then leads to the funds being transferred to the wrong account. I'm actually doing a brief webcast about this uh, this afternoon today on Monday. So if you want to learn more about business email compromise, I'll go over some particular scenarios that uh, I've seen in the past uh, just using this and similar schemes. Of course, if you have any kind of cloud-based web email, then the same threat happens. I noticed that Google has actually gotten quite good in identifying illegitimate login attempts but it doesn't mean that there aren't some that slip through Google's defenses. The real solution here is probably two-factor authentication, also audit accounts for new forward addresses being added. That's probably the most common scheme that I have seen where the attacker, instead of continuing to log into the account, just adds a forward to address so the attacker receives co copies of all emails. Now, one way to educate your users about phishing, of course, is to conduct regular phishing tests to see how many people click on these emails and also demonstrate to your users what these phishing emails look like. Last week, a reader actually forwarded us one of these phishing emails. It was pretty easy to identify it as a test because it had additional email headers that literally said X phishing test. But as Didier points out, well, an attacker could do the same thing. Of course, if a user does look at the header, they're probably not going to click on the link after they figure out it's a phishing test. In this particular case, uh, the IP address from which the email came was also associated with the company that was conducting that phishing test. So in so far, pretty sure that this was just a test. And last Friday, a pretty interesting vulnerability was made public in Git. Git has the ability to store large files that you don't really want to manage in as much detail as you do want to manage your normal source code with something called Git LFS or Git Large File System. Now, in order to do this, you have to add a special configuration file to the repository that lists the sources where you can pull down these large files and the mechanism that's being used here may be SSH. Now, if I'm using a host name as part of the SSH URL that starts with dash O, then the host name is interpreted as an option and with dash O proxy command, I can then execute arbitrary code on your Git server. Now, typically for a private Git server, this may not necessarily be such a big deal uh, because you only have developers and somewhat trusted insiders that actually can modify these files, but it also affected public Git servers like, for example, a GitHub. Now, like I said, the problem has been addressed. This may, by the way, not just affect a Git, it may also affect SVN, Mercurial, and CVS. So your exposure is likely limited if you do run your own Git servers and in particular if you have a large number of users, then definitely this becomes a pretty important vulnerability because exploitation is pretty simple and straightforward. 
And the open source database Postgres uh, came out with a pretty important update. Probably the most uh, severe vulnerability here is that an authenticated user may be able to retrieve other users' passwords. There are also a couple other not quite as bad vulnerabilities that are being patched here. One, for example, made it look like a user account with an empty password was enabled, but it actually wasn't really enabled, but would allow anybody to log in. It was just that the default Postgres client didn't allow for empty passwords. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.